Order, order. We begin this session, which is a session we have branded as Ask Pickles. Um, Secretary of State, thank you very much for coming uh, to us this afternoon. And this is an opportunity for us to put to you, on a quick fire basis, some questions that have been tweeted in by members of the public. So we're looking for quick fire questions and quick fire answers. Um, thank you very much, Secretary of State, for uh, coming once again to this session. First question I've got is uh, uh, one's been sent in by Kath McCubbin, um, who's uh, complained about small villages being under threat due to a local plan and five year land supply not being in place. Uh, what help can you offer? Uh, and she helpfully said as well, uh, don't say neighbourhood plans. Well, the first thing I would suggest to her would be neighbourhood plans, because I think <laughs> it's important to get on the side of the question of story away. In, since I last appeared before you, about 80% of the country is now covered by. Um, a, uh, a, a local plan, um, at least in a published state, as they start to bed in, they offer, I think, um, a real protection in terms of, in, of ensuring uh, that the boundaries of, of villages and communities are defined. But nearly 50% haven't actually got an agreed local plan. No, no, but, but that, will, uh, that, will <clears throat> that will increase and uh, uh, once you've got a published plan, there's a fair amount of weight attached uh, uh, to that. Um, as you're aware, and uh, I'm not making this for a political reason, when we came in, relatively few places had a plan. We've seen uh, them blossom very quickly um, in a few years. And I think it will mean that at last we will have town and country planning in this country as opposed to development control. Well, there's been quite a lot of support for, rightly, for neighbourhood plans, but uh, Swanton and Morley Parish Council um, tweeted in, um, shouldn't you be telling communities um, that because of the lack of a five-year land supply um, and the lack of a local plan, uh, neighbourhood plans have been drafted in good faith, uh, but then are over, been overruled by the presumption in favour of sustainable development, and so people might feel they're wasting their time. No, the presumption in favour of sustainable development is a protection. If you will recall before this, there was a presumption in favour of development. And uh, something that has a neighbourhood plan has uh, uh, an additional uh, weight um, on top of that of, of, a, of a published plan. And that's why 10% um, of uh, uh, England now is covered with neighbourhood planning. And um, uh, you recall, I think when I came here last time, I said I thought this would be the year in which the full impact of the uh, localism act would start to be felt. And I regard neighbourhood plans as the kind of forerunners of this. I think it makes enormous difference. It, uh, it changed the nature of Germany for the better when we introduced them in Germany after the Second World War. And I think they've been a very good thing in the sense that um, the public, I think, have shown to be responsible and realistic. People thought there might be a Nimbus charter, they've proved to be anything but that. Okay, some of the other big contentious planning issues um, uh, around probably the energy field, and uh, uh, Gemma Grimes has uh, tweeted and said, what challenges do you see facing local authorities in dealing with applications for fracking sites? Obviously, what causes quite a bit of contention. Well, we, uh, we will ensure that uh, the proper regime is ad addressed with regard uh, to uh, with regard to safety and to environmental uh, impact, and we will obviously treat uh, applications for fracking in the same way as we would treat um, applications for any kind of uh, of development. Right, but uh, people might see fracking as a, a much more contentious uh, you're looking for the government to protect them from it. It's certainly been my um, uh, experience that uh, all forms of, um, of energy generating, whether that be uh, windmills, solar farms, um, incinerators, uh, fracking, uh, that they all tend to be very controversial. Yeah, and I suppose uh, one of the other large numbers of tweets we had was comparing perhaps government more stand back approach to fracking with, um, uh, well, to, to summarise a lot of tweets, uh, why are you ignoring local decision making and interfering in planning decisions relating to wind farms? Um, isn't this going to have a, a bad impact on the development of renewable energy? Well, remember, we only um, interfere with, uh, with those unless we're, we, we call a, um, 
an application in which is we, we call we we rarely call it applications in anywhere. Well, we only interfere uh, where the, there has been um, an appeal, and it's usually an appeal against uh, uh, refusal. And I think we've uh, probably we're talking about relatively a small number. I think the controversy came because I thought there was a a problem uh, with the interpretation of the NPPF. And uh, what I sought to do was, because of our need for energy, which you quite rightly say, unless you were putting um, a windmill up against Dove Cottage or Blenheim Palace or somewhere, the environmental and the historical and the cultural aspect just weren't, weren't uh, important enough to weigh against uh, uh, the value of having um, a windmill. And what I sought to do was to say that it was possible, even given our absolute need uh, for energy, to be able to balance the environmental factors. Um, so I don't think we've had that big an impact. And I did notice that, well, of course, I don't, we don't pay that much attention um, uh, to the, uh, the judiciary, as indeed they don't pay that much attention to us, that there was a court case, as you recall, last Friday, and they thought that the way in which we had considered um, uh, the problem uh, reasonable. Thank you. Uh, my questions uh, from the public are all related to the funding of local services. The first one is a very moot one. Uh, local authority budgets under pressure. We'd all concede that. I think we'll find out more about that tomorrow. Um, obviously, the priority is given to the statutory services. Uh, are you confident that the non-statutory services can be adequately protected in all circumstances? Well, I think um, I've never really... Um, understood or appreciated uh, the difference between statutory and non-statutory services. I think uh, local authorities are there, to are there to deliver according to local priorities. People have mentioned parks and, and, and libraries. And, and, uh, by and large, they've, I'm so sorry. People have mentioned specifically parks and libraries. I didn't say yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, um, libraries, of course, come under a different uh, department. Uh, uh, I'd love to get my hands on them if I could. There's lots of things we could do with libraries, but that's another story. Um, I think local authorities have managed it exceptionally well. Um, I think it's not a surprise that uh, uh, satisfaction in local authorities' uh, uh, services have gone up. Uh, I am not surprised that the level of reserves have, um, have gone up. They're now at a, a record uh, high. And I think local authorities have, have managed amber in this whole process of uh, having to deal uh, with the the deficit, and I think they should be uh, commended. And I'm very confident <coughs> they can, uh, they will be able to produce quality uh, services, given that the relatively small amount in terms of their um, uh, their spending power has, uh, has gone down in, uh, in recent years. Just specifically on the reserves, I thought you'd bring up this, that subject. What do you attribute this increase in reserves? I understand there's not just earmarked reserves; it's non-earmarked reserves. Have the department any done any work in finding out why they've gone up, given that local authorities appear to be so hard pressed? Well, I, I think that's because uh, they've been particularly efficient in identifying um, uh, various economies, uh, and they should be commended uh, for for doing that. And of course, it's always a a very difficult uh, balance in dealing uh, with reserves to ensure that you are keeping something. Uh, back for, uh, to use a cliche, a rainy day, you, or you may be planning to do something uh, with those reserves. It's not unusual for council to kind of save up and, um, uh, and apply them uh, to making sure that you don't uh, keep uh, too much back uh, uh, in reserves. Uh, and the, the avaricious eye of the Secretary of State looks upon you and, and takes out a sing single that you're doing very well now. Thank you very much. So increased reserves is a consequence of laudable efficiency by local authorities, that's what you're saying? I'm sure that's right. I'm sure it's not miserly savings and bad management. Okay. Uh, the second question I had to ask you, uh, and you slightly answered it already, is we're distinguishing between the essential and the non-essential in local authority terms, or the statutory and the non-statutory, we want to do that. What do you regard as the core services that local authority needs to provide? Well, I think local authorities uh, should have a a discretion in terms of um, of, uh, of what they um, uh, provide. I mean, I mean to be a um, 
a councillor to be um, a, a council official, you're very close to the population. You're there really to serve uh, the folks. You're there to serve um, uh, the people that elected you. You're not there to kind of manage local services. You're there to provide what local people are looking for. And uh, good local authorities have a, an active engagement with uh, uh, their, their population and, and, and seek to, to mould those services around what the population wants and needs. So the core services are defined by the population? Say again? The core services are defined by the population. They might be well, different to different places. That, I mean, yeah, I think that's actually quite a, um, a profound thing to say because I guess one of the biggest pressures on local authorities is the growing elderly population. Um, uh, when myself and uh, Mr. Betts were a lot younger and, and involved with, uh, with local councils, you could kind of see what was going to happen with the elderly population. Um, the, the numbers that were coming, but we were uh, at the, the small foothills of, of, of the kind of problems that we're dealing now. And I think the nature of, um, of social services have changed enormously uh, in 30 years uh, to what I, I, I once described it as um, a backwater, but I say I volunteered to go to that particular backwater, to now to be very central and <coughs> almost the dominant service in counties and in metropolitan authorities. Okay. Okay. The, 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 the NAO have um, produced a report of work on financial sustainability and local authorities, and one of the principal findings is the department was not wholly aware of the impact of some of the funding reductions. Um, and uh, in answer to questioning by the Public Accounts Committee, Bob Kerslake, Sir Bob Kerslake said you work with the Treasury in order to assess the impact of the spending reductions. Yeah, um, how are you going to respond to the NAO finding? We're in a constant dialogue with the Treasurer on, on all things, and it's always a pleasure uh, to, to deal with them. But I think, the, uh, with enormous respect uh, uh, to the NAO report, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding about the roles of local authorities and the relationship between local authorities and the department. Local authorities are, are, um, are independent bodies. I, I don't seek to overly uh, regulate them. And I'm more responsible in terms of determining the government grant, which increasingly um, is uh, not as important in terms of their financial makeup that it was um, um, a, a few uh, years ago. And I obviously do not control the total amount of expenditure that they have. Um, after all, I um, exercise no control uh, over the size of their um, uh, council tax charges, which have remained steady for the lifetime of the coalition uh, uh, government. And if, lo if, local, forgive me, if local authorities uh, felt that the amount that they had was... Uh, well, uh, inadequate, then of course they could put up the council tax. Okay, okay. can I just... Mark, sorry, I'm not, we have to go to Martin, sorry. Yes. Secretary of State, I've got some tweets that we've received um, on the topic of local democracy, and the very first one is from the Association of Democratic Services Officers have asked for an update on the undertaking that you gave to Ask Pickles, which took place last January, on the, changing the law to allow council agendas to be distributed electronically. I'm very much in favour of council agendas being... Uh, um, uh, transferred uh, electronically. I'm a regular user of my own iPad, not government purchased or purchased through this building. Um, but I've never had the courage to do it at the dispatch box because I was always kind of fearfully after tapping the, um, the post, the necessary password to get in. I mean, one of the problems have been that we've been trying to persuade our colleagues um, in Wales uh, to come in with us on this. But sadly, the Welsh government doesn't want to do so. But I'm delighted to tell you that before Santa Claus uh, starts to rattle his bells over this, uh, we will be issuing the uh, the appropriate uh, uh, statutory instrument this I'm week. I'm sure those who sent in the tweets will be delighted. I've got another one from James Kane, who's a member of the Youth Parliament, who wants to know why don't councils have an obligation to engage formally with young people through the Youth Council? Well. I, I think that would be very much like saying, why don't they have an obligation to engage with the public? I think they should do it. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I've seen um, my uh, local rep on the Youth Parliament, I think they do a phenomenal job. 
And it's kind of, it's very interesting actually that often you'll find uh, parishes have a, a much closer relationship with, uh, uh, with, uh, with young voters than many of the principal um, authorities. Though I think there are some shining examples uh, um, among counties, districts, and Mets for engagement uh, um, uh, with, uh, with, with young people. And I think the most important thing is to do things that are relevant to young people. Uh, Secretary of State, we've got a, one from Totnes Town Council, and you'll remember the report that this committee did on the role of the council, councillor, and what the uh, council in Totnes want to ask is, what will the government do to encourage more people to stand as a local councillor, and do you think that current levels of engagement are good enough? It, it, it depends. In some places um, in the country, it's difficult to find councillors, and... Uh, um, Council group leaders have to resort to the old life. It's only a couple of, uh, of nights a month and it won't really take over your life and all that kind of thing. But in other places that uh, uh, people are coming forward. And I do think it's an obligation, uh, whether you're in a political party or not, the leader, the chairman of the council, I think should do their best to ensure that people can become councillors without having to make a major sacrifice um, on their careers and also to find that it is a very rewarding thing to do, that they are just stuck on committees. Mr Secretary of State, is there a role for government there? No. no. Okay. Um, next one is um, sticking with the role of local government, how local government operates. Tom Hancock asks us, how effective do you think the local government scrutiny function is? And could scrutiny be made more effective? I think scrutiny has uh, improved and we had the, um, we had the experiment of the standards boards, which I think was just unbelievably dreadful, and I was pleased that there was all party consensus to getting rid of it, and it just seemed to be clogged up uh, by quite petty um, objections uh, to the behaviour of particular councils. I can recall, I think, uh, the very pits was of a couple of drunken councillors fighting in a pub car park on a Thursday evening. Now I think the electorate should take care of that kind of thing. Scrutiny, I think, to my own, should be about what the council is doing, what it's spending its money on, um, uh, its fiduciary duty, its pecuniary uh, 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 duty. And I think um, it wouldn't have really been possible uh, to have got rid of the standards boards unless we are also combining it um, uh, with a greater degree of transparency and openness in terms of the uh, publication of, of, of minutes and indeed uh, recently uh, allowing uh, proceedings to be filmed. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask some questions about finance, uh, Secretary of State. Um, this one's from a member of the public um, known as Joey. Uh, why are councils cutting staff but not red tape and waste? That's what I keep asking. And I think that's a, uh, that is a, so a Joey student. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to thank I want to thank my auntie for putting that particular uh, question. Uh, in. No, I, I, I entirely I entirely agree. I mean, having been through this process um, a few times, both in terms of uh, of, uh, of being a councillor and also a government minister, when you're faced with the prospect of having to reduce your uh, your council, I mean, the worst thing to do is to say, right, we're going to have fifteen, we're going to have a five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent reduction and what I think is sometimes called salami slicing. That doesn't really help at all, I don't think. It just causes uh, disruption. You rarely achieve your targets. What I think uh, councils have done, and done, I think, remarkably uh, successful, and this is right across the political uh, divide, is they've looked and sought to say, well, what should we be doing? And put the priorities around that. And I think it is easier uh, to uh, arrive and fit within a budget and, and deliver if you do that. And I could you know, cite lots of examples. And also, of course, um, this whole process of local authorities working together, cooperating together, and actually producing something a lot better. And the uh, Association of North East Councils, uh, 
Yes, bless them indeed. Um, would like to you know, will the government publish an analysis of the cumulative impact of reductions to council funding since 2010-11? Well, the short answer is no. We've no plans. Uh, we've more, no plans to do that. I'm pleased that we've, <coughs> uh, we've managed to uh, ensure uh, that uh, in the north, uh, in the northeast, uh, that the um, amount of um, of uh, government grant is something like two and a half uh, times the size. So, big pardon, one and a half times the size uh, that it is in, say, Workington or Oxford. Uh, Oxford West, it's better I think in areas that clearly need a lot of uh, government finance that we've managed to ensure that that gap has actually even uh, widened, that more money has gone uh, uh, to, to the North East. Well the Association have got another question um, really. Sorry, is, I think there's somebody's phone going off, could yeah. we just make sure that all phones are switched off please? Otherwise, kind of you, if it's you. still going off please leave the room. I was kind of hoping it wasn't mine. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, Secretary, will you address the financial pressures facing children's services from a 40% cut in funding since 2009? Well, I think the amount of money that has uh, gone uh, in children's services um, is actually rising, so I don't recognise those figures. Um, uh, in uh, 2010, it was 6.6 uh, uh, billion pounds, and 2013-2014, uh, it was 6.9 um, uh, billion pounds, and a billion pounds does go rather a long way. So I don't recognise those figures. Uh, uh, I, I, I presume they, they have grounds to ask that. But could I also um, ask from the Federation of Master Builders, should local authorities prioritise investment in their procurement departments to increase SME engagement? I do think that's right. I mean, we've had um, quite a bit of, um, of push with this, also with the, particularly with the Local Government Association, to try and ensure that pre-contract questionnaires were kept to a minimum, in fact kept below um, the uh, EU um, uh, target for uh, uh, a EU threshold uh, that they have to have. And there's been a bit, for, for reasons I don't entirely understand, uh, on, on uh, is that um, there has been pushback from local authorities uh, on this. And it, it means that it's so much more difficult uh, for SMEs to get local contracts. And it's quite permissible under uh, uh, European procurement uh, rules to, um, uh, to look towards uh, local suppliers. So yes, short answer is yes. Okay. And of course, uh, local government, nevertheless, despite that, it could do better. There's an awful lot better than central government in that regard. And, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so don't, don't get me going. Uh, don't get me going. Exam. Thank you. Uh, questions on devolution and localism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my first question is from Councillor Martin Taylor Smith. Uh, why has the creation of a new unitary council, uh, unitary councils, been blocked? For example, uh, Shropshire have streamlined services and saved over 100 million. Well, th there isn't actually um, a block on unitary authorities. I mean, I've got a framed copy of, I think, the Municipal Journal of me with a gunny man saying that I would shoot the first person that uh, talked about reorganisation. I think I'd like to clarify that because I'm not a very violent man. I took a view when we came into, when the coalition came into to office, that um, if we were to try to do a reorganisation, um, that uh, asking local authorities to take a considerable reduction to work that process, that it would just lead to, to utter chaos. Um, so I put any reorganisation back on hold. And if you forgive me, can I just be a, a little longer in, these, in this question, then I'll be really quick in all the others, because I think it needs to be explained. Um, most local, most reorganisations are taking place on the basis of governance, and generally speaking, the governance happens, and then you, and the reorganisation fits. We decided to work through a, a localist model, and the, the groundwork was. Uh, the, uh, lo uh, the Localism Act to get it in pl into place. And rather than do reorganisations we've always done, which is on the basis of the lowest common denominator, we say, you know, um, uh, little boggle side can't cope, little boggle side won't be able to do this, so you produce a whole thing that little boggle side is entirely happy with and can do. 
So the city deals have been on the basis of, well, who can cope? Devolve power, devolve um, the, the process to uh, an, an organisation and a local government structure that can take it. So in a way, I think we're, we've got a, we're in a game of catch-up. And at some time down the line, uh, when the, the, the pattern of local government becomes uh, more settled, then, then we might look in terms of, um, of a reorganisation. But I felt that this was a, um, myself, uh, 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 Greg Clark, um, uh, the Chancellor, and others felt that this was the quickest model to get power out to local government. So that's why, that's why we've done it. There's no stop on... Um, on unitaries, but what I do ask is, because generally speaking it's counties who come and ask for a unitary, but they just want to obliterate the districts. If the districts and the county come together and say, we think it would be a great idea to have a unitary, then um, I think they would arrive at open arms and... Uh, okay, know. this is a follow-on from that from uh, Peter uh, Eckersley. Uh, why does local government in this country have such limited control over taxation compared to other developed uh, nations, will you change this? Well, we're prepared. I mean, part of my frustration I feel sometimes, and uh, sometimes maybe I get a little, little grumpy about this, is every time um, a council wants to talk about devolution, they just want more ways of taxing people. And the real success of the city deals, the, the Sheffield deal, uh, the Manchester deal, is actually a bunch <coughs> of people came to us and said, this is what we want to do. This is the difference we're going to make on training. This is the difference we're going, uh, we're going to make on transport. Give us these powers, give us this money, give us this ability, uh, this, this independence, and we'll do it. And um, I think if uh, local authorities thought more in terms of how can we improve the service, how can we make it different, then actually finance and, um, and structure and governance and sovereignty would follow relatively quickly. And just a final question from uh, Simon Bones. Is devolving resources and powers to unaccountable LEPs a threat to local democracy? Well, it would be if we devolved it to the LEPs, but of course uh, the LEPs, the money, uh, the, the power is actually devolved to um, uh, a local authority. And the LEPs were completely designed, as I think I said here um, years ago, as um, a close horse. They're there to ensure that local authorities got used to the idea of, of sharing finance, sharing resources, sharing sovereignty to, to do things. Of course, the LEPs give that additional um, uh, business input, uh, the local economy input, but the money is going to local authorities. It's, uh, it's not going uh, to the, the LEP structure. And I was clear that was, a, that was the trick to do it. And I think, you know, with, with well, modesty, it's actually worked quite well. Okay. Okay, so Thanks, uh, seasons. Greetings, uh, Secretary of State. Uh, uh, happy winter fest to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My first question is from Rochdale Online, which is a leading news organisation based in uh, Rochdale, by coincidence. Uh, their question is, you, you've curtailed the use of council spending public money on free newspapers for propaganda purposes, uh, which I think they, they're happy with. Uh, what can you do about councils who use social media for similar purposes? The regulations apply to all forms of media, whether it's uh, social media, print media, um, local television media, radio media. Um, so it applies to the whole lot. Good. And uh, if they have any abuses in mind, do let me know. <laughs> okay. uh, the second question is from Totnes Town Council. What evidence is there that the new standards regime has been successful? Well, I would refer the, uh, the gentleman to an answer I gave earlier. I think it has worked um, a lot better. I am much happier uh, that councillors get their collar felt of um, dodgy dealing, financial dealings, or, uh, or failure to declare a, a pecuniary interest. And I think that's a really important thing. I think the previous standards regime just became an industry and it became part of a succession of people just sometimes using it to persecute mm -hmm. um, individuals and staff and the like. Okay. And my third and final question is from Mike Short. Are you concerned about the low levels of pay in local government with large numbers of council employees being paid below the living wage? Well, I think um, uh, local authorities have an obligation to deliver good services. Part of that process is respect for their workforce. 
part of that process is to ensure that um, you know remuneration is paid um, at the appropriate uh, uh, level. I mean, one of the things that uh, we've been through um, in uh, recent uh, years, of course, was the equal pay legislation, which we uh, most authorities, with one notable exception, kind of um, uh, ex uh, managed to exhort over a reasonable period. And you know, it was really difficult in the initial period because, in many ways, the legislation was ahead of social attitudes of getting people to kind of understand that uh, people are entitled to um, a, a reasonable pay. Of course, I don't determine the level of pay in local authorities, that is determined by the employer side, which is the, uh, the, the local authorities. Okay, Chris. Thanks. Can I also extend season's reasons to you, Secretary of State? I'm happy winter first time. Back. That's very kind. And a happy thank, Christmas. Thank you very too. much indeed. Uh, I'm just going to deal with house building and housing markets now. And the first question that I have is from uh, somebody called Jennifer Line, and her question is: uh, What's the solution where affordable rents unaffordable, even for those who are on more than the minimum wage? Well. We had a, uh, a situation where there was virtually no, um, no investment uh, in, in social housing. We had to find a way of uh, producing uh, 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 numbers. Um, we needed to move closer to, uh, to the, the markets. And um, it's the same problem that people face in the public sector and in the private sector. It's, uh, uh, it's one of the reasons I, I chose my particular house, you know. I, I could only go to where I could afford them. Okay. The next one then is from the Building and Social Housing Foundation and they say compulsory purchase powers are being used in London yeah. for private development. Shouldn't they be used to meet affordable need too? I'm aware of the specific case in a specific locality. Um, I need to be very careful in terms of what I say because I can't uh, prejudge uh, anything that may eventually uh, come to us. Um, uh, speak as an ex-council leader and people around this, I think compulsory purchase should be used extremely sparingly and extremely carefully because you are essentially taking people's property rights um, away from them. I think it's up to the individual councillors uh, to explain um, uh, the, the decision that they have uh, taken uh, in the context of their, of, their, of their wider population. Okay, and uh, third question is from UK uh, Co Housing Network, and uh, their question is Is the government doing enough in its commitment to facilitate community build and self build housing? Well, we've done quite a lot in, uh, in recent. Um, in recent uh, 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 months, and I'm really keen on self-build, and I think self-build sometimes has got a, an image of sort of you know seven brides for seven brothers. <coughs> and we put these things up, and I, I think it, it's it's moving into an area where it, to buy a house is going to be more like to buy a car that you're going to be able to buy. Um, I've seen. Uh, various uh, uh, developments will take place where you decide whether to buy the house minimum water type and then do the rest yourself or you build it up to a particular standard and then you do the rest and uh, I think that's kind of future. It's how it happens kind of, uh, in Europe or on the States where people will look to, to get the plot, um, uh, hire a builder to a particular level and then uh, finish it off. I mean, obviously, you've got to be design standards because <coughs> no one wants to live next to Frankenstein's castle or Disneyland. Okay. Uh, penultimate question, if there's time for the for the fifth one, is from uh, South Downs Park, and they say, why shouldn't developers have to contribute to affordable housing, even on small developments? <coughs> well, we've taken a view that in order to <coughs> protect the green belt, uh, to uh, develop brownfield sites. To bring back uh, small builders, uh, which uh, have diminished enormously over the last uh, 10 years, and to get some of these small sites going, uh, that uh, we will release them from certain obligations. Principally around the country it's 10, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in national parks and, 
um, other places it's down to five. I think it's a sensible thing to do because those are areas that need building, those are areas that have often small size where if we were to charge them full um, uh, 106 um, then the, probably the sites become economic to, um, to develop and, mm -hmm. and in order to, for councils to be able to have a sufficient supply. Uh, I, I think that plays a very important, I mean I've got rural communities in my part of, of the world and getting those two or three houses in for local people often is, is very difficult and you often need uh, the cooperation of a housing association to be able to do it and this is just to try to get um, small builders back into the process. Okay, we've got time for the final question. One okay, it was the last question, this is another one, second one from Jennifer Lyne and uh, she asks, so community-led housing epitomises localism. Why are there so many hoops to jump through? That's a great question. I mean, I entirely agree and we are doing our best to reduce the size, mm -hmm. in, um, increase the diameter of the, of the hoops and reduce their numbers to make it easier. But I think it's a really good point. Um, I mean, sometimes, uh, well, it's true also planning that you just, you've got the decision and you've still got all these things to go through, but I entirely agree. Okay, thank you. Mary. Thank you. Um, according to the charity guide dogs, 78% of councillors support strengthening the law to prohibit uh, pavement parking. Do you agree that councillors need to be given tougher powers to deal with pavement parking? They've got tons of powers. I often found that I get lots of people that keep asking me, why don't you do this? Why don't you give them powers? And often they have powers to do so. And clearly, uh, parking on pavements is dangerous. It's not just dangerous to people who uh, have difficulty uh, seeing. It's, it's dangerous to people who are uh, carrying something. It's dangerous to, to, um, uh, to people pushing a pram because often you have to go out on the road to get around uh, uh, the obstacle. Um, uh, particularly uh, in town centres, <coughs> they're often the pavements are capable of supporting the weight uh, of a car over a protracted period. So I would urge councils uh, to look uh, strongly to ensure that uh, parking is uh, appropriate. I mean, while they're doing that, they could also free up a bit of parking uh, to ensure that people can go to shops. But it, there can be no excuse, I think, for parking uh, on pavements. Okay. So, uh, this question is from the Fire Brigade Trade Union. As there are virtually no redeployment opportunities, surely this means if firefighters fail a fitness test, they lose their job? Well, um, I think that is certainly. Uh, not uh, the case. We were very keen uh, to ensure, and we went through a debate yesterday to ensure that wouldn't be the case. And it is now very clear if firefighters fail um, the test, if they fail it on the grounds of um, uh, that they are uh, unwell, unfit because of, then of course they, they will receive um, a full pension. Uh, what the change has taken place just means that if a firefighter is unfit, they have to go through a process uh, of trying to get the firefighters back into um, a, um, a fit condition to be able to uh, uh, to be able to fill their jobs. But um, uh, if they can't and they can't be redeployed, the effect of um, of yesterday's decision is that they will get a full pension. Um, uh, if I'm being really blunt, I was very hacked off uh, with uh, the employer side who refused to make this uh, concession um, for two years, and that's why we're putting it into a statutory instrument. And just okay. it's a sign that uh, I thought the firefighters had made a, a very reasonable point. Okay. On, a, on a, uh, another point, Simon Bacon sent in this uh, uh, message. Should people be able to be punished for leaving their wheelie bins in the street after they've been emptied? They should be flogged. They should be flogged. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be an headline tomorrow, I can assure you that, Secretary. Said <laughs> <laughs> next door. <laughs> you were doing so well as yeah, well. Yeah, is too, is too good for me. Um, well, I mean, clearly, I mean, if um, it, can't be, it applies to the good neighbourhood, uh, doesn't it? If, um, 
if you have some, if if, if you somehow manage to leave your wheelie bin a jar, or God forbid you put a yogurt butt into the wrong thing, we were we were on you like a ton of bricks. Mm. But if you're parking the damn thing in the middle of the road, it's not exactly good neighbourly, is it? And uh, and uh, people uh, should face a full nuisance. But if people are are, are parking them outside their house and uh, they're not leaving them in the middle of the road, then I think they should be just flying. Okay. And, and from Paul Jeffries, he says, will you improve litter enforcement? Well, that's up to local, um, <coughs> that's up to local authorities uh, to do that. But more importantly, it's up to the public to do that. Mm. And, um, I, I mean, I, I am of an age where I'll walk miles out of my way to put something into a litter bag mm. because I was, uh, it was kind of drummed into me at school, but I'm just kind of amazed that, uh, you know, people who you would think would know better, the mm. casual nature of throwing things down. Mm. I, and uh, I recently walked around a city centre with a, um, a council team uh, and they're explaining the difficulty they were having removing um, a chewing gum. Now, the effect of the chewing gum to remove it requires these high-powered hoses and the like. Those high-powered <laughs> hoses often get uh, crack down the crack of the pavement. The cause of that often lifts the pavement, which causes the pavement to, 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 to shatter. Mm. It costs probably millions of pounds a year, unnecessarily, uh, in order to keep our streets in some kind of order. All because some people are disgusting enough to spit their chewing gum down the floor. Okay. Uh, and then my final question is from Philip Whited, I think he's a councillor actually. He, he says, why can't local authorities make their own traffic orders for simple changes such as car parking or local speed limits? It would save millions. I will pass that on to Patrick McLaughlin the next time I see him. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we might have a go at him as well on that in another format. Uh, seriously, uh, we've had a, also from uh, Dan Peters. Um, very simple question, really. What's your biggest regret after almost five years as Secretary of State? My, 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 my biggest regret is that I haven't seen enough of you people. And, yeah, we haven't done enough of these sessions. I suppose the um, biggest regret is I didn't start, we didn't start the Troubled Families programme until a couple of years on. I've seen how effective it is. I've seen the way it's changed, the way not only in people's lives, but also in terms of the way local authority services are provided. I kind of wish, I've had sort of three years at it, I would love to have had five years um, at it. I think it would have, uh, I think it's mm -hmm. changing uh, social policy, I think it's changing the way local authorities fund, and I think it's shown that if local authorities and um, and uh, national government are prepared to trust one another's judgment and work together that we can actually achieve some great things. Okay, and uh, this is one from Gareth Evans. Is it fair for you to be lecturing councils about finding savings given the size of the department's bill for limousines? And that's not one to pass on to the Secretary of State for Transport. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm extremely pleased uh, to be able to, uh, to deal with uh, the question of, of the limousine because for further and better particulars, I've managed to get the sums. I mean, the, honest, the answer is very straightforward. When I came into office, we had six um, uh, cars for the ministers. I thought that was excessive, so we reduced it down to two. We've reduced the arm, arm, uh, spending by, uh, by two thirds uh, on, um, on, on transportation. The only way in which our friends in the Labour Party were able to produce those figures was they combined several years together. Coincidentally, it was the, uh, the, the sum uh, that, uh, that Labour spent uh, in one year that they were accusing me of spending in five years. And I have the figures for the financial year 2007-2008. Uh, um, uh, we spent uh, uh, 401 £401,600 and in last year I spent 
thousand uh, pounds, eight hundred and thirteen. Um, and of course, these uh, these <coughs> cars are not just for me; they're for six ministers and for uh, for top officials uh, to move various things about. But I still am a I, I still have uh, my Oyster card, and uh, I still use public transport happily. Okay, and. Uh, Finally, Secretary Stetton, I don't really think I'm drawing a comparison between your department and uh, seasonal theatrical productions that happen at this time of year, um, but if you were given um, a role in a Christmas show and were offered a series of alternatives, which particular role would you like? You've got three to choose from, um, either The Wicked Uncle, Scrooge or The Fairy Godmother. Well, I always think... Um Playing villains are, is better uh, than um, than being the fairy godmother, and of course one of my favourite books is um, is Scrooge. And you remember that um, after the um, after the ghost of Chris, the Christmas to come finished with him, and um, he repented and uh, looked after Tiny Tim. He said many people laughed at him, but if ever a man understood the true meaning of Christmas. Uh, then it was Ebenezer Scrooge. And I would like to think, if anybody understands the nature of localism and local government, <laughs> it's Eric Bibbles. <laughs> On that point, Secretary of State, thank you very much for coming to answer such a wide range of questions. Could I take this opportunity to wish you and your family, your ministerial team, uh, a very happy Christmas? Probably won't wish you too much success in the new year, given what's coming, but no doubt other members would do. Uh, but can I also uh, wish all members of the committee and our excellent staff and services as well uh, a yeah. very happy Christmas as well. Yeah, thank and you very could much. I, could I say on behalf of the ministerial mm -hmm. team to, to uh, this uh, committee that I wish you and your families a happy Christmas? and a peaceful new year, mm. okay. right up till May, depending on your <laughs> <laughs> Order, order, that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you very much. Yes.